Uh, hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to Bramasol's latest webinar. We are here today to talk about accounting automation in S4 HANA, improving speed, compliance, and financial analyses. Uh, my guests here today are Julio de la Costa, uh, who is our Director of Technical Accounting, Birgit Starmans, uh, Director, Senior Director at Global COE Finance and Risk. That's a mouthful, Birgit. And Sarah Thompson, who is our Senior Solutions Engineer. Uh, and I am really excited about today's presentation, everybody, because um, we just played this to a packed audience at SAP Insider, where well over 100 people uh, saw this presentation and it was very well received. So I know you're all going to get uh, a great deal out of it. So with that, let's get moving. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Universal Journal. We'll talk about intelligent accounting and the financial close predictive analyses and simulation, process optimization, uh, moving from manual to automated processes, uh, and then GRIR, accounts receivable intercompany matching. Uh, but what I think you're really going to enjoy is the back and forth between Birgit and Julio, talking really about uh, the perspective of the user. So Julio is going to talk to us about his perspectives as the controller, and Birgit's going to help us understand, so how does SAP solve those problems? Uh, reminder that this webinar is being recorded, uh, and I encourage you all to ask questions throughout the session. We got a large number of questions during our presentation last week. So again, please feel free to uh, ask questions. Uh, you can download previous webinars from our homepage. You can come here up to the Resource Center, uh, check that out, or uh, by downloading here on the home page if you scroll down a bit more. I'd also like to encourage you to contact us at bramasol.com. You can come up here, contact us. Uh, check out Facebook. We have posts every day about great new articles and information that you can learn about uh, what it is that Bramasol does, but also just plain old topics uh, that we can talk about and you can learn about in the areas of finance, innovation, and transformation. And then finally, uh, join our groups here at uh, LinkedIn. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Julio and Birgit. And uh, we'll get a demo from Sarah, show you how these things work. So Julio and Birgit, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, everybody. This is Julio de la Costa. So just let me start off by saying, John, that I am very excited about this presentation. And as an accountant who's been in the trenches for a number of years, the idea of automation of the accounting processes is very exciting. And it's a good time to be an accountant in today's uh, environment because what it really means for me as a user of financial statements and a preparer of financial statements is that I can now focus my team on doing value add rather than doing transaction processing. So that is really why I'm so excited today. If you could see my face, you'll be seeing all smiles, John, but <laughs> it's really an exciting time to be an accountant, I have to say. So, so with that said, let's get right into it. So. As we know, S4 is a very big project. S4 is a large process, and Bramasol's perspective is all, always to focus on the office of the CFO. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, what are the benefits, what are the real-world benefits as you go from one system into S4? There are a number of really interesting and cool applications that you can use to really help drive better processes, faster processes, better results, more transparent results. And this is the real cause of our uh, webinar today. So Birgit, I'll just give you some, 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 some talk tracks here as we go into, tell us a little bit about the digital technologies, about how business gets done from your perspective. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's a great, great thing that you said, it's a great time to be an accountant. I'm finding that while finance used to be the last line of business to adopt new technologies, finance is now becoming the first line of business to adopt new technologies. So that's a really exciting change. And there are a lot of applications that we have now where finance is really at the forefront. So if we take a look at the transforming finance organization in the middle, that's really our digital core. Um, that's our S4HANA um, finance system in the middle. So what you see around are other enabling technologies. Basically, we call them Leonardo. 
So <laughs> I like to joke that that's basically the marketing term for the technologies um, that we put in there that enable S for HANA Finance. So one of the things that we're going to really focus on today um, is really the robotics and machine learning, which is part of that. We're also going to talk a lot about the cloud. But if you look at all of the different technologies that are out there, they're really supporting what finance can do, not just technology for technology's sake, but really to enable finance, as Julio said, to be more strategic. Back to you. Yes. Next slide, please, John. So from our perspective, when you talk about what is the office of the CFO, the office of the CFO focuses on, on all the risk of different roles and, and responsibilities within the finance organization. From going left to right, you have your VP of finance, you have everybody, you have the head of corporate accounting, you have essentially everybody who has a vested interest in how can I do my job better? So what does that mean? Today, we're really gonna focus on the head corporate reporting and head finance operations. We're gonna talk a lot about transactional accounting. And as we know, as the accountants on the call know, transactional accounting is probably mundane, but extremely important. So what happens, and I think John was gonna to talk to us a little bit at the end of our discussion about what happens when you transform a transaction reporting professional into a strategic professional. And what exactly what Birgit just said is very important in the sense that now is a great time to be an accountant, but more importantly is what is the business benefits of moving to a system like S4? So today we're going to really focus on transactional accounting and the real world benefits. And most of the benefits from these systems are here today. It's not in the future. So we're going to really talk about that. We'll get anything on this slide you want to just expand on? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I want to say is, um, yeah, this is our value map that we've had out there on our finance um, FAQ.com page. And so it applies to ECC, um, but it has been expanded to accommodate new functionality that we have within Estrahana Finance. So you'll definitely see that there are expanded capabilities here. And we're also calling out some, some of the cybersecurity topics a little bit more. But as Julio said, we're concentrating really on the clothes and finance operations today. Yeah. Next slide. So if you think about what, when, when, you, when a company moves to S4, what is making all this possible? And the concept of the SAP Universal Journal is, is a critical component in this whole discussion. Next slide. So I will let Birgit go into some granular detail about what is a universal journal, how does it work, but just from a high level perspective, it's a single source of truth, which is very important from a data integrity perspective, because you have all your transactions, all your transactions for, uh, for a situation being recorded in that universal journal. So I think that is one of the key features of what happens when a company moves to S4, you have this concept of the universal journal. Birgit? Um, yeah, so the concept of the universal journal basically is that um, we used to have different tables uh, to accommodate different kinds of transactions. And that's basically because at the time we did not have HANA. So we basically had to have multiple tables so that we could access the information. Unfortunately, that also meant that we also had to have total tables and index tables. So for example, we had the BSEG table, and then we have various different tables um, in ECC for cost centers, for internal orders, for projects, et cetera. And then each of those had its own total table, the index tables. So that basically meant a lot of reconciliation work between those tables. The Universal Journal actually takes all of that information and puts it into one table. So that means that we've got our GL accounts in here. We also have all of our subledgers, whether it's asset accounting, accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, the material ledgers in here, all of our CO data is in here as well, cost centers, profit centers, projects, internal orders, et cetera, and also profitability analysis. Um, mainly account-based profitability analysis, but in a central finance instance, we can also do um, cost-based profitability analysis. And the other good thing is that we also have more operational information. So taking the example of accounts receivable, we used to take a look at the general ledger account accounts receivable. And then after that, um, 
we needed to know what the customers were. So we needed to go to another report to figure out which customers are impacted. Then we needed to go to another report to figure out which products are impacted. Well, actually, all of that operational information, be it customer, vendor, product, is already in the Universal Journal. So it's accessible and reporting. So basically, with HANA, we can roll up all of that information in real time without having to look at totals tables, without having to migrate information into a data warehouse. Such, a BW, such, as, such as a BW system. We don't need to do that anymore. So we've got one place where we can do the actual, the planning, as well as the analytics. Yeah, and, and Birgit and Julio, if I think of it from, from the talk that you gave and the questions we always get, what I love about this is what you talked about, Julio, which is the single source of the truth and getting away from having to run back and do different reports. If you think about, and maybe, you know, Birgit, you can comment for a second on this, or, or Julio. You know, Julio, you and I have talked about a scenario in which, um, you know, you, you report to the CFO, the CFO asks you a question, you said, that's a great question, let me get back to you, because you have to go back and say, oh, as Birgit said, no, I've got to go pull another report based on customer data, vendor data. The Universal Journal eliminates that and really eliminates two things. One is time it cuts way down on time and the other one is it presents the same single quote unquote we love to use the single source of the truth but information that everybody's sharing at a single time yeah john if you could just flip to two, two slides down there's some i just wanted to go over some of the core benefits for the audience so mm -hmm. if you think about as you said john the single source of truth what does that actually mean and I really want we get to go in and describe some of the true benefits from not just from an accounting perspective, but you know there's great benefits of using S4, the in-memory processing and all that good stuff. But you know from a data integrity perspective, you know all accountants want to make sure that the data that they're pulling is accurate and not only accurate, but it's timely. And exactly what you said, John, is if you think about when you go to these management meetings and your CFO asks you a question and you say, well. It's going to take me two days to pull the report, download an Excel, analyze the data, and get back to you. The beauty of Universal Journal is because it's one source of truth, you have all the data at your disposal. Now, Birgit, why don't you give us some more insight on that from this perspective on, you know, from a process perspective? Well, the interesting piece of the re reconciliation back in my consulting days um, the customers actually used to download uh, all the transactional tables, all the totals tables, all the BW tables, and reconcile them out, and then they would start to close. So that's basically not necessary anymore. Just because we have fewer tables, um, we can basically take all of that information and with the power of HANA can calculate all those totals immediately. Now, one question that comes up sometimes, um, doesn't that mean that the numbers might change? Well, the thing is, if you're talking about the close, we still have timestamps. So the numbers aren't going to change for prior periods. But if you're doing your um, reconciliations or if you're doing your reporting throughout the period, you can really get an idea of what the state is of your financial statement at any point in time for continuous accounting. So you don't need to wait to run these period and jobs that often ran overnight. You can run those at any point in time, every day, every hour if you want, and get an accurate depiction of what your financial statements look like at any point in time. And actually, that is a, a great step to the next slide. So, John? Yep. So if you think about the advanced financial close, you know what Brigitte actually told us just now is essentially the concept of continuous close. Why is that important? That's important because us accountants, always reporting into management, they're always asking, how are we looking? How are we looking for the month? How are we looking for the quarter? How are we looking for the year? And I think this is the type of tool that I would want to use as an accountant who's responsible for the financial reporting of a company. And that actually takes us into what are some of the benefits? There's a current and there's a vision from the S4 moving to the advanced financial close. Today, as discussed, we're going to talk about GRIR. We're going to show you a demo of GRIR. We're going to talk about predictive accounting. Everybody wants to know about how can predictive accounting help me as the controller, the CAO, the CFO, do my job better. Then we're going to talk a little bit about accrual management and we get into cash management. So, Birgit, why don't you talk a little bit about the 
vision on the right side, which I think you can talk a little bit about, correct? But not too much. I can talk a little bit about that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if, you look, if you look at the closing here, um, you know, we've got the financial accounting of ICO, you've got the entity close, which is your company code, um, basically your legal entities, the group close, that's corporate, and then the financial reporting, uh, which, is the close, which is the closing, generating your financial statements. <clears throat> so what you see up at the top here is the S for HANA for advanced financial closing. This is basically going to be the replacement for the financial closing cockpit. So that's something that um, is available currently in the cloud and will be available for on-premise um, later this year. But that takes into consideration um, a lot of the um, items that take advantage of the Leonardo slide that we that we showed at the very beginning. So machine learning for goods and goods and invoice receipt reconciliation, predictive accounting, um, incorporating more things such as the GRC portfolio, such as process control, et cetera. So the advanced financial closing is really going to be the replacement for the financial closing cockpit that allows you to manage each step of your close process, um, whether that's a manual step, whether that's an automated step, or whether it's a step that is now being powered by machine learning. Yep, thank you very much. Next slide, John. John? I'm sorry, I was having trouble with my mic. Oh, um, there was a I was there was a question about um, you know if you look at month end uh, and in production, um, do you still have to wait until? Hang on one second. Um, so there's a question. Hold on, guys. I'm sorry. So John, so, that yeah. actually question can be answered in the next couple of slides because we're just going right. to talk about that in predictive accounting. All right. So, Perfect. All right. So now we're moving into predictive analysis and simulation. So everybody wants to, so as, as we said earlier in the presentation, accountants has been traditionally focused on the back end process, the historical, you know, the cool guys get to work on forecast and what does the future look like and strategy. And I think now, as Birgit correctly mentioned, is that accountants will be not just historical, but we will be predictive. Why is that important? That that's important because when we focus in the OCFO, we are focusing as a business partner, as opposed to a cost center. So there's there, there's different discussions about accounting, not just being a cost center, but actually being a profit center. Why is that? Because we're adding value, not just to the accounting organization, but to the business strategy of the company. So this is what the, the predictive accounting. So there's the concept of continuous close. And the next slide, John, will tell us a little bit about, a little more granular detail about what does it actually mean? So Birgit, why don't you give us some insight from your perspective on the predictive accounting modules? Yeah, so there, there are pretty much two ways that, that um, I tend to look at predictive. And so, one is um, to take a look at some documents that might be in the system already, but that have not had a financial impact yet. So one example, for example, is a sales order. Uh, it has not been invoiced yet, so we can't really see that as part of receivables yet, but we know that it's coming because we've already created the sales order. Um, the same thing is true of something like a purchase order, because we've already created it, we know that we're going to have to create a vendor. So we have some predictive capabilities, for example, our liquidity uh, management. Um, which forecast based on some of those open items, even though they have not had a financial impact quite yet. Um, the other piece of predictive is to really take machine learning and do more of the what-if analysis and more of the simulation analysis. So basically taking certain profitability drivers, whether it's by product, by channel, by customer, um, yeah by geography, being able to look at that and to predict what the financial statements might look like in the future. And we really leverage machine learning in order to, to drive that predictive engine. Yeah. John, if you go to the next slide. So what Birgit actually just talked about was looking at predictive gross margins. So exactly what she says, right? So you have, you know that you have your sales order already in the system. You're not going to recognize revenue until a transaction happens or an event happens, but you know you have that sales order in the system. 
The same thing when you look at accounts payable. You know you're going to pay your rent every month. You know you have certain accruals that just don't go away because you have a building, you have a, a car lease or what have you. So it's not like the accounting is just, you know, putting your thumb in the air and saying, I wonder if I can do 2%. No, it's actually using data that's already in your system that's going to leverage current data to have a better, accurate, more accurate forecast for the future. So what does that look like and why is that important? I actually like to go over this example. Let's say you come down to the middle of the month, and I've been in this situation many times, and anybody who's on this call who works in finance can probably attribute the same thing. If you, you come down to the middle of the month and your CEO asks you, you know, Julio, how are we looking? And I say, well, right now, if we were to finish the month, we would have X amount. If we have that information on the middle of, at the middle of the month, what other things can you do as an organization to drive sales? So I can give you one example, you know, especially in the hotel business. If you work in revenue management in hotels and you come to the middle of the month and you're not trending to your budget or your forecast, you can actually give a promotion. You can give a discount. So therefore, you can try to get as close as possible to your numbers. This is why this is the power of predictive accounting. And by what Bird just said, predictive gross margin. And it's not like you're saying, I am going to predict what I'm going to do. No, this is data already in your system. We're just utilizing it in the right way. Birgit, any thoughts on that? I, I would completely agree. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to point out in addition is um, that we see some of the margin reporting up at the top, but then at the bottom we see some of the individual transactions. And so that's, I think, an important thing to realize that yeah, as we roll up information and look at some of the trends that we can see all the way up at the top, uh, we can also double click on anything and get down to the transactional level. So it's not just reporting and we don't have to go to yet another report to get the details, but we can actually double click on any of this information and actually take a look at the transactions and actually double click into the transactions and take, take actions on them without having to leave this general reporting screen. So I think that's very powerful to not have to keep flipping back and forth between screens. Yep. Next slide, John. And actually, this, this slide is not necessarily directly related to the accounting closed, but I thought I would include it because if, if you think about organizations, you're always trying to figure out how much should I order? What's the future of my procurement process look like? And actually, the machine learning in this situation really helps to drive your process and make better decisions faster and more accurately. So, Birgit, I know we didn't, this is not necessarily the accounting side, but I wanted to bring this in to show the users and, and the people on the webinar about the power of machine learning as it comes to, you know, how much, as far as your orders go, making orders on time, making sure you have the right spend from that perspective. You want to give us a couple uh, talk tracks on this one? Oh, sure. Um... So, yeah, the whole idea of embedded machine learning, we're not trying to change the way that the workflow goes. So basically, the normal workflow happens, but then we embed machine learning as part of the process. So in this case, with the predictive models, the machine learning is actually running in the background. So there's nothing extra that the user has to do. Um, and so that's actually a huge benefit because that way they, there's not really a retraining that's required to leverage machine learning. Thank you. So, John, just, just to wrap up this section of our webinar, what do you think about machine learning as far as predictive accounting goes? I know you have some, some good thoughts on that. Yeah, I think machine learning is phenomenal as it relates to predictive accounting, Julio. You and I have talked about it in Birgit a lot. Um, you know, if I go back to the days or even go to, you know, what we do today from a revenue recognition perspective, you know, being able to apply machine learning and predictive analytics on top of something like RAR is fantastic. You know, think about the idea of being able to take an RAR-like tool and predict how things will change if you were to modify your contracts and make different assumptions based on your POBs uh, or any of that. So this is great. And I know, you know, when I was a, a program manager at AT&T a number of years ago, tools like this would have made us 10 times more um, effective in the marketplace. The one thing I will say, by the way, is um, while Birgit 
um, did say it does not affect your workflows and your processes. The one thing I will say is um, machine learning is only as good as your workflows and processes. So don't forget about that because it's important to look at your processes, look at your data and ensure they work properly to get the analytics to work properly. So. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Actually, John, that, that, that's actually a good point because we received a number of inquiries last week at Insider. And one of the questions we had from the audience was, what happens in an environment of changing fluctuations? So yeah. I have my 10-year data set, and I'm going to use my historical data to predict in the future what my business function is going to look like. But what happens if I'm a constantly changing business environment? So Birgit, why don't you speak about that? Because we spoke about this inside of last week, and I think your response was very, very critical. Uh, I think um, there's a lot of change management that happens. Actually, a colleague of mine um, that I presented with last week, she made a comment of, well, she thought that she was getting a job as a business analyst, but she ended up being an accountant. Um, but the thing is, a lot of people are doing very transactional manual work where they're touching pretty much every single transaction. And so there are going to be some people that don't really want to change um, or don't really want want their, their work the way that they, they do their work to change. Now, I mean, in a way that's good because there's going to be somebody that has to touch these transactions anyway. But I would say for the most part, just like my colleague, most folks get into finance because they do want to be more strategic and basically provide advice to the business. So there's going to be some change management and retraining involved because for finance to become more strategic, they need to develop some critical thinking skills, um, learn, learn to use these new tools when it comes to analytics so that they can basically take a look at the financial implications of decisions. I think I used the example of an M&A. Um, if I'm going to acquire a new company, which one do I want to acquire? Or should I build my own product? What are the financial implications of that? So that definitely requires some retraining and change management. First of all, to explain why the change is being made. And then second of all, to make sure that the skills um, of the finance department actually match what they're being asked to do now in this brave new world. Yep. Thank you very yeah, much. And I think yeah, and the other one was, Birgit, I remember you and Julio talking about the fact that the machine learning learns, right? So change is inevitable. Uh, we all know that and that the inputs may change. But at the same time, as you're looking at, you know, thousands of transactions, the machine learning tool learns. That's the whole purpose. And it begins to look at the different variables. I think, Julio, you and I spoke with this person about you know, if you're even doing a complicated econometric model, for example, to do your 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 forecasting, you have four or five, you know, three, four or five different variables that are the major factors in that process. You'll start to look at those more carefully and use those and and use those in your machine learning tools. So, you know, absolutely. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and I think that, that's, that, that's one thing that, that you know, we train machine learning tool with old transactions um, and we need a minimum of 5,000. But of course, the more data you have, um, the better it learns. But then as exceptions come up, um, it continues to learn. So that if an exception comes up and somebody from the finance team um, takes action on that exception, the machine learning tool learns what action was taken and continues to apply that logic in the future as well. Right. Yep. yep. All right. Okay, next slide. So now we move into accounting process optimization, the brave new world for accountants like me who get excited about these processes. These processes are very mundane, as you would know. They are part of, they are core part of many organizations. And to me, the exciting part from an accounting perspective is you take a process like accounts receivable or goods receipt, invoice receipt, or accounts payable. How do you make that better? How do you make it more efficient? And this is the exciting part of it. Next slide, John. And the answer to that is really process optimization. Underlying all accounting processes is a business process. It takes a certain amount of time, certain amount of FTEs to actually do transactions, to close out the month, to close out the year, close out the quarter. But if you look on the screen, you're moving from a manual process. The reason why we really want to like to talk about accounts receivable, accounts payable, goods received, because it's really high volume. It's high volume. And for the most part, 
people are actually doing it manually. So accounts payable, accounts receivable, they're matching these things on a manual basis. And where I, why I get excited is because if you move to the right side of the screen, you see that all this becomes automated. So Birgit, why don't you give us some insight about moving from phase one, then phase two, and lastly, the ultimate goal of the phase three, automated processing. Yep. So I think that this is also a factor of trust. So the manual processing is pretty much what we do now. Um, so we configure a lot of rules in our configuration tables. Those rules become less effective over time because very few companies go back and actually revisit those rules. So as business models change, um, they're going to get more and more exceptions. So that's the manual processing piece of it. So when we have machine learning support, once it learns from those 5,000 plus transactions and continues to learn, um, a lot of customers will configure a tolerance. So basically it, they can say, well, give me the suggestion, but I want to look at it first because I don't really trust you yet. Um, so then basically machine learning comes back with, well, here's what I would automatically clear if you were to let me, um, and here are my suggestions. And uh, as we've been working with our customers, once they get that comfort factor, they'll actually allow the, the system to automatically clear those items. So whether it's cash application and accounts receivable, um, or whether it's a GRIR transaction, and they can configure tolerances. So a confidence factor, for example. I need to be 95% confident that this is correct before I let the let machine learning post automatically, or I, can, I only need to be 75% confident that this is the correct thing. So that way, as the machine starts to learn, and maybe a customer and accounts receivable pays one amount, but it, it needs to be matched to three different invoice, three different invoices. How comfortable do I need to be to allow the machine to process automatically? And I would say that most customers, once they've seen the the, the suggestions from machine learning engine, they get more and more comfort comfortable with the system posting that automatically. So, so what I love about this, Birgit, is you know, one month. It comes up as an exception, and you tell you, you tell the system this needs to be matched to this vendor or that vendor. The next month, it disappears from your exception listing. So as you said, it learns every period. I think that's the really critical part of this whole understanding of when people talk about machine learning is that you have 10 exceptions in January. You train the system to pick it up. In February, you now have five exceptions because the five it has learned in the previous period to match this this transaction to that vendor. I think that's the powerful part of it. So it's always it seems like it's always freeing up additional time to help us accountants do our job better. Yeah. I think also I like the you know the trust, right? So many times in change management or in business process design, we talk about you know, Julio, you and I were on a call earlier today. We were. You know, on Treasury, talking about how do I trust? Here's a great example of how you trust, right? In the beginning, how do I actually trust manual processing works? Yeah. Well, it's because I've done it so many times. Here in phase two, as Birgit outlines, it's a great way to understand trust, you know, as, as Ronald Reagan used to say, right? Trust but verify. Right. This is your trust but verify. And finally, you get into you know, the automated process. So absolutely, love it. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about some goods receipt, invoice receipt. Next slide. So everybody knows the GRIR process. It's part of the three-way match process. You have a purchase order, you have a goods receipt, that you have a purchase order that you order the goods from. The goods come into the warehouse. That is a goods receipt. And then you have the invoice. In SAP, you have to match all three for it to post to your cost of goods sold or your uh, transactional processing. If you don't have that matching, it's going to sit on your balance sheet. And every time I talk about GRIR, I have to give a 10 second story of my personal experience because the GRIR, it really gives me chills because I took a job some years back. I was a controller of a large subsidiary for oil and gas company. And I step into day one and I see a very significant GRIR sitting now on my liability side of my balance sheet. The next question I ask is, what is this? They said, oh, we haven't reconciled this account in over two years. Okay, so it took us about 15 months to actually go through line by line 
over 50,000 line items that the AP department had to physically match. And then the next question I had was, what's the impact? Well, unfortunately, I had to go to my CFO and say, the person before me forgot to reconcile the GRIR account, and now we have a significant change in our reporting. So our income actually went down because we didn't post the right transactions. It's a lesson that we learned that always reconcile the GRIR. Now go to the next slide, John, please. Now I've, I've set up my problem and the problem of most people who work in GRIR. Now let's hear the solution. Birgit, why don't you give us the solution from SAP's perspective? Sure, and this is actually something that, that has been very recently released. So we've got GRIR account reconciliation, basically leveraging machine learning. So going back to the whole idea of um, having the same workflow, so there's an automatic clearing process that happens. We've got GRIR pro processes that happen. But then basically all those open items need to be looked at. And this is actually a big pain point, um, as you just mentioned yourself, is that there are a lot of open items to be looked at, and that usually takes a lot of manual effort. So first of all, even just the process without s hana um, would run overnight and would take a very long time. But in this case, right now, we can take a look at, at machine learning and basically see if goods receipt equals invoice receipt. And if it does not, we have a recommendation. And this is, again, based on machine learning, based on prior transactions of what should and should not be cleared. So should something be cleared? Should it be written off? Um, do we want to do automatic clearing? So the same thing um, with the steps that we talked about earlier. So we have manual steps, but as we start including machine learning, we can have the machine learning application basically make a proposal, and then eventually a customer can decide whether or not it wants to automatically clear those items. And that really is has been a big pain point just because there are usually a lot of open items that need to be dealt with at the end of every period. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, John. So since we talked so much about GRIR, we're going to have Sarah Thompson from Bramasol give us a short demo on the power of the GRIR solution. Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Julio. I am going to share my screen. Let me know when you guys can see it. We can see it. Perfect. Yep. So when we first come in, there's a couple things. So similar to what Julio and Birgit are saying, I agree 100% with everything they have and we're gonna kind of, sh or what they've said, and we're gonna show what that looks like. So when you first come in, there's a couple things. The first place is a monitor of GRIR. So imagine with machine learning um, that you as a, an accountant have a, place where you can come in and you have a pre-filtered uh, work focus on what you want to see with your GRIR reconciliations. So we can view it by company codes, suppliers, material group, and then we start to see some of the embedded charts that show the real-time data. So when we first come in, you can see the chart on the left. This is going to be um, all of our um, open reconciliation or purchasing documents that are grouped by their processing statuses. So we have a couple of them here. There's some corrections that need to play, take place. We've got some write-offs that need to take place. As you kind of scroll over, you can see all of your documents that may have a invoice amount surplus and then a goods receipt surplus. You can group these by supplier. What's great is we can also make changes to these graphs. So if we didn't want to see it by supplier, maybe we wanted to see it by a purchasing org or purchasing groups to see who's in charge of those. Uh, you could change these graphs in real time to see what that would look like. We can also continue to kind of scroll through below, and what we're starting to see is you've got the overall number of open F5 positions for GRIR, again, by company code, by posting date. Uh, we can see directly and navigate any of these um, reconciliations between GRIR by clicking on these graphs. Uh, we can see all the open items that are out there by month, so we had a good period um, sometime in the summer, but picked back up here in the fall. So again, you've got a real visualized view of what everything looks like. It's a lot easier to understand. Now, this is just giving us kind of an overview of our reconciliation process. 
using the machine learning in the back end. But if we wanted to actually do some reconciliations, we can actually come in and we've got our uh, reconciliations page here. So what this does is we've actually embedded a chart here in the middle that gives you the number of items that are proposed for high priority, you've got remaining ones, you can change the status, um, and that's all defined in your intelligent ERP. So based off machine learning, based off of past reconciliations, as you know, Birgit and Julio were mentioning, it's gonna continue to learn based off of what you do. So it sees the processes that are made as I continue to come in. Right now I'm really monitoring everything that's out there, I'm monitoring any of the changes. I can see that there's you know, write-offs that need to be performed. I can see there's corrections that need to take place. Um, I can always filter, so it's gonna give me my automated filter capabilities here. Uh, you know, looking at certain suppliers, looking at certain company codes. Again, as the user, you get to determine what you want to view. So if I only want to view my company code, I can just view those company codes. You know, last 30 days, let's say, I want to see everything that happened, you know, within this year or last year, uh, drill into all of those company codes and all of those views. Another thing that we've got over here are the unique ability uh, for this purpose-built reconciliation app is a feature that SAP uses, smart facts. So if you think about it as humans, I mean, we really aren't made to sit and just stare at numbers and process and see, you know, prioritize based off an Excel sheet and be able to know what's most high priority and be able to do all of that calculation in our head. What SAP did and with the machine learning is you can see with these smart facts, I can just come in and see, you know, is there an invoice surplus? Um, you know, is it a goods receipt, goods quantity service? Is it a cost surplus? You know, was there no goods receipt even posted to these accounts? It's got these different ways that it can search across all of your GRI or reconciliations and just filter out those little pieces. So I'm gonna keep it as is now. What we'll notice here in the middle is I can actually see um, all of my purchasing documents by company code. I can also view all of these documents below, both the graph as well as my purchasing documents by different dimensions. So it's gonna continually give you the ability to filter down and get to the most granular level of information that you need. Again, I can filter by any of these here. I can always come in and you know maybe update these by priority, update them by who's actually processing uh, these different GRIRs, uh, my purchasing document groups, suppliers, uh, if I wanted to bring those in, I can group all of these and see all of the graphs as well as my uh, work list down below changing for those priorities and for those updates. Next. Sarah, Sarah, I, actually, I just have one question. Yeah. So when you, when you say it can sort by different suppliers and, and purchases, how does that look? Does it, is there a graphical interface as well that you can, like you just showed before? So yeah, I can make these graphs change. So I've got two different suppliers here that updated, three suppliers, you know, a couple suppliers, only one in 110 or 310. I can view those by status and supplier, or right. yes, you can always go back and look at the other documents or the right. other worksheet by supplier. This is excellent, Sarah. Thank you. And Sarah and Birgit, this is fairly standard SA. This is standard SAP. There's no customization. We're not customizing anything. This is standard stuff, correct? Correct. Yep. And and a quick question um, was asked earlier on as we were looking at the GRIR. Is this Birgit or Sarah? Is this in lieu of running um, or staying on top of uh, the MR11? I'm not familiar with that myself. I'm gonna have to delegate that to Birgit. I'm not. I'm not either. Uh, so, so basically, I mean, um, a couple different ways that you can do this, but um, yeah, in general, you would basically run your normal, um, your normal GRIR reconciliation with Hana. It's it's done a lot faster. And then what machine learning does, it run it then runs on the exceptions that have fallen out of that. So then that means that um, it can make proposals for those exceptions. So basically, it's not in lieu of, it's in addition to as a secondary step. Thank you. Yes, Joe. 
All right, so once we have gotten our, our subset of our records, so everything that we want to view, we've got our table view down here, the multiple dimensions that we want to see. We can see purchasing documents that were there. I mean, you can continue to scroll across, and these are just the uh, fields or dimensions that we've brought in, but you can see that it's got a proposed root cause, a proposed status, so there's a differing quantity in your invoice. You need to correct the invoice expected. This is going based off of the machine learning that it um, that takes place. So based off of what's happened in the past, based off of looking at our delivery and our invoice, there's a discrepancy there, and it's going to tell us, well, here's what we propose should be done. From this screen, I can actually go in and pull up that purchasing document. And so here we're going to see quickly um, that smart facts have been applied and we can see in this case that there's the good vo invoice amount that is differing. So as we scroll down into our um, amounts down here, we can see we've got our goods delivery, uh, the overall delivery, so what was actually delivered from a goods amount and then the invoice and then what is the balance from a cost perspective as well as the balance by each individual piece that was invoiced. And then you can scroll down, you've got the ability to drill into the actual journal entries that were created. You've got the ability to come over and see all the different amounts that were financial postings that took place. Uh, but really what you're seeing is where these quantities lie is there's, this is really going to expedite the overall reconciliation between these purchases because uh, as the transactions take place where there's any variance that must be reconciled before you can close the books, you can see what that variance is in one screen that's letting you know, hey, we think that this is an invoice uh, reconciliation or an invoice surplus that needs to take place. Yep. So I can actually come back and if I wanted to, um, or you as a user can come back to the screen, you can now decide how you want to reconcile. So you can create an assignment for this particular one. So we can assign it to someone. Um, we want to say, or assign this to what we actually believe the cause is. So it'll give you recommendations, let you know. We think it's going to be an invoice correction. You get to set the priority. Um, who do you want to process this invoice? And then the actual root cause. So again, it's determining based off of learning in the back end what exactly should be the root cause um, and then you can quickly just go through and again as it learns it can start removing these from your list as you've got you know lesser priority uh, GRI or invoices things that you just want to automatically write off it's going to know and learn based off of the different um, tools that you give it The next piece is going to be moving through. Um, I can go through and actually get to a root cause. So today, if I were to run in this issue, maybe I see some of these things. I believe that someone should take a look at this. Um, a new thing with S4 HANA and with SAP is going to be uh, looking at your copilot. So from here, instead of actually taking this and you know, going offline or going through email or trying to understand what's going on, I can just come in to a new chat. And let's just say we want to talk to the purchasing manager. This is an invoice uh, issue that we want to see handled. I can bring in an object. So there's a couple different capabilities. I can grab my purchasing document that I was just viewing and actually include it into my message. I can also take a screenshot. Uh, for example, if I wanted to take a screenshot of exactly where I am on this screen, saying that we're looking at this invoice and this purchasing document, um, and then I can send this off so that they have the ability directly within the system to say, okay, I see where you're at, um, need to correct invoice receipt for this purchasing document. And all of this is going to be captured, all of this will be saved in SAP so that they can quickly just drill back into the document, understand what's going on, and make the correct proposals. Um, without having to leave SAP, it's also going to be utilizing this information for 
the machine learning to say, okay, this is how we handled this. Now this is what we're going to be doing going forward with these very similar um, activities. All right. So I will turn it back over to you, Julio, to wrap up. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sarah. It's been very helpful, Sarah. Where was this tool five years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so John, if we could go on to um, cash management, uh, account receivable, because I really want we get to really focus in because this is a really cool application. I'll just set it up from an account receivable perspective, which is essentially, we all know the matching of payments coming in from the bank, from the lockbox, from the various bank accounts, and somebody has to manually go in and match that to the invoices. The cool piece about SAP CAS application is that it does it for you automatically using machine learning. But why don't you give us some really good insights on this one? I really like this app, I have to say. Well, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning is that um, finance is now first to embrace a lot of these new technologies. So the SAP Cash application app, I always feel like I'm stuttering when I'm saying that, the Cash app app um, okay. was actually the first one to be um, to leverage machine learning. So of all lines of business, et cetera, it was the first one in finance, but it was the first one in general that we came out with. So it is also the most mature. Now, the, the good thing is um, now as we start to talk about it, um, if you would have heard me talk about it last year, there would have been one big hole. There is That hole has been fixed. We now have a lockbox. <laughs> That's huge for North America because pretty much um, every, everybody uses lockbox um, you know, as part of their cash application for receivables. Um, the other good thing about the cash application is that um, it also takes into account um, basically non-transactional data, so payment advice. So if, if um, a customer is returning a payment advice stub, whether it's a PDF or whether it's a scan or whether it's an email, um, it takes that into consideration as well. So we've got bank statements that we reconcile with, historical information, our master data for banks, for general ledgers, et cetera, but we also have that payment advice remittance now so that we can take um, some of that information and it's 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 basically an advanced form of opt optical character recognition or OCR. So basically, it'll take that information, understand what that means, and then be able to make decisions based on that. So this is basically our poster child for machine learning. Um, it is the first one that we've done. Um, improves day sales outstanding. It's integrated with S for HANA. And one key point about the architecture here, this is actually based on our um, SAP Cloud platform or SCP. So what that means is that we run cash application in the cloud, which is why you see kind of the cloud icon in, in the middle of the screen. Um, but uh, as part of SCP, we can run it against on-premise or private cloud or public cloud. So while cash application runs in the cloud, you can still run it against your accounts receivable in an on-premise environment. So that's actually a huge deal because that way we only have to develop it one time and then we can use it against our cloud implementations or against our on-premise implementations. Um, while it was initially developed for S for HANA, um, we have now built a connector um, that allows it to, to talk with ECC as well. So that allows us to address customers that are not yet on S for HANA. So this is an exciting, exciting application. And John, if you can just go to two slides down, I know Birgit likes this slide, and it, because it actually, <laughs> this one actually includes a lockbox function, right Birgit? It does, it does. So we've got the bank statement import, we've got the lockbox import, um, you know, we've got the scan PDF, EDI, email, so basically all the payment advice. So we've got incoming and out outgoing payments, um, and then basically just taking a look at different scenarios. So we've got a payment to receivables, so some customers might be doing an advanced payment. Um, we also have to take a look at the general ledger, count, general ledger counts. So basically, um, going through that process and going through those decision matrix of what should be done with any kind of incoming payment. So, um, you know, especially the line item matching that we have all the way on the right, um, is this something that's being pay paid against a single invoice? Many customers will send a payment that goes across multiple invoices. 
um, or multiple payments on a single invoice. So those are all the scenarios that make cash application a bit more complex. And this is where some of the machine learning takes it comes into effect. Now, there are certain customers that might normally pay against multiple invoices. There are certain customers that might normally pay multiple payments against a sing single invoice. And there's a pattern of behavior, so we can actually get down to the customer and product level in order to make these decisions. Thank you very much. With, uh, the same with short payments as well, right, Birgit? Yes. Yes, John, definitely. So, John, if you just take us down to the one slide on accounts payable, I know that SAP is, in, is, is currently working on the to be solution for accounts payable. So, Birgit, why don't you just give us a couple high level points of? I know you can't talk too much about it, but you can say a little bit about it, right? No, I can't talk too much about it, but um, yeah, basically we started with receivables, then we went to GRIR, so um, we are working on, on payables as well, and we've gotten that inquiry from a lot of customers. So that is um, the vision to basically do for payables what we have done for receivables with our cash app. Um, that's pretty much all I can say right now. But, uh, Thank you very more. much. It's excellent, actually. So, John, if you want to take us through the summary, I know we're running out of time, so why don't you take us through the next slide then, John? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Julio. Thank you, Birgit. That was fantastic. Um, you know, I think the the important thing to think about in this process is all the benefits that can accrue from uh, automated uh, processes that we have here. And I know Julio gets so excited. You know, everybody gets excited in the audience when they they think about this. But the first thing is, you know, anything that you start with an S4 HANA transformation or any of these processes, you should begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey used to say. What is your goal in automating these processes? And really think about, you know, is it about saving money, saving time, uh, leveraging assets for other areas? So think about that process. The real benefits of automation within the accounting system, what, what are they? Um, many of those real benefits accrue to uh, auditability. So automation not only helps you with the issues and challenges of offloading repeatable transactions, but really increasing uh, the reliability of audits and lowering the cost of audits. So it's that follow on uh, piece. Um, obviously do not forget about data and analytics. Uh, assess your data early, assess your data often, really take the time to invest in that activity. You know, as Julio and I and Birgit have been talking over the past several weeks in, in numbers of uh, discussions, Data comes up every single time, and it's not just the data itself, but understanding how you use that data, where do you use that data. The, the blessing and the curse of S4 HANA is data. Um, there's infinite amounts of data, just huge amounts of data available to you, but you need to understand what data matters and think about what data matters, what processes matter, and make sure that you've taken a uh, control of that. Finally, change management. Um, you know, as a business coach and uh, you know, having run a number of different projects that involve change management over the years, you know, you have personality types, you have people. Um, don't forget to focus on the people. It's all about looking at not only transactional to analytical work, but the people who do that, the people who are comfortable moving a number from A to B to C and seeing those results get comfortable and they feel good understanding that trust. You have to work with them to build that trust. And I think early in our presentation, we talked about phase one, phase two, and phase three. That's something that you need to take account of. Make sure you build that trust. Use updated user interface tiles. Um, they simplify but change is hard. Um, I remember a project that we worked on a number of years ago where the customer actually said, but I like my SAP GUI. I know that if I type in VF44, something happens and I know what it is. What's this tile thing? Um, you know, work through that process, training, train, train, train. Um, so, you know, let me wrap up. I see folks, you know, um, getting anxious. I wanna thank Sarah, what a great demo. I think it shows you all of the power of what exists here. Julio and Birgit, thank you both. You know, This is a great presentation. For those of you who want to get more information, please reach out to me at jfrolick, F-R-O-E-L-I-C-H at bramasall.com. Again, this presentation will be available 
uh, on our website very soon. And we look forward to hearing from you all. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. And uh, just have a great one.